Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. The text for our sermon is the gospel which we just read. Please take your seats. <clears throat> My dear friends in Christ, every now and then, TV programs seek to answer a question, is there life in outer space? Back in 2000 in a program called Universe, it was stated that scientists had hoped to be able to prove beyond any doubt by 2010 that there is life in space. Well, 2010 has come and gone, as you know, and uh, I don't think we're much wiser about extraterrestrials now than we were then. But suppose for a moment that scientists did find that there is life out there in the universe. What would that change? How would that change your understanding of God as the creator of the world? How would that change your understanding of how God relates to the world and to us as his people, unique people, special people, because we are in Christ? The first thing to note is that even though we continue to find out all kinds of new and exciting things about the world and the universe, none of that changes what we know about God, his unchangeable nature, and his love for us. In fact, the more we learn, the more we realize we are only infants, almost just about beginning to crawl when it comes to this kind of knowledge and understanding. But the more, the more that is discovered, the more questions that are opened up. I remember so, so, so uh, well when they first found the nucleus, and then they found the, the, the center. They looked into the nucleus, and then they, a whole new world opened up. And then they looked into a little part of that, and now another whole new world opened up. This is the nature of the world in which we are created. We can never get to the end of it. We never seem to find, or do we? The second thing that we, becomes clear is that you can't find God by looking through a microscope or a telescope. Neither can we find God on the golf course, looking into the eyes of a baby, or looking at a beautiful sunset. No matter what the most beautiful place is in the world that you have in mind, that you think, ah, I see God, you're not seeing God. The truth is that unless we know God as revealed in the Bible, we will not discover this God who is the God of love, this God who sacrifices himself, this God who is a savior, always presence, always knowing, always saving, behind all that is beautiful in the world. There's no way you can know that any more than you can know what my middle name is unless I tell you. The third thing we realize is that we can scour the universe. We can have vast amounts of knowledge in our mind. We can understand all kinds of things as so many professors do and did in my day when I was going to university and yet they didn't know God. It's almost baffling. How can they have so much wisdom, how much have so much knowledge about so many things and not know God? Logically, we can deduce from the things around us that there must be a creator. All kinds of proof for that, you know, we could go on and on about that. But to know him extends simply beyond what we can see, what we can hear, what we can taste, what we can touch. He goes past that, and we simply don't have the tools. We come up against something that is so big that our intellectual toolbox simply can't reach into that unknown spot. It's the point where reasoning stops, and we go, wow, and faith begins. We know from the Bible that the big thing is God so big that nothing can contain him. Time doesn't contain him. Power doesn't contain him. Knowledge and reason don't contain him. And yet, this God is so loving, so personal, and so compassionate. Today is the feast of the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what's all this got to do with 
a transfiguration. We're told how Jesus' appearance changed, how his clothes were blazing white. We are told that he chatted with Moses, the giver of the law, and Elijah, the prophet. And then there was the voice that spoke from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Let's look at it this way. We all need oxygen. With every breath of air, our body receives oxygen and uses it for our blood system and for our body. Oxygen is also in water, but we can't use the oxygen in the water. It's not available to us. Like the oxygen in the water, God is in nature, but not available to us there. If you want to know God, not near merely know about God, don't stare at a waterfall or a tree or a beautiful sunset. Don't look into a microscope or into a telescope as to see if you're going to find him there. Don't look into the eyes of a newborn baby and say, I see God, there he is. As beautiful as, as all these things may seem to us, I can show you all kinds of ugly, horrible things in this world that may convince you that there isn't even a God. So if you're looking for beauty in order to describe God and say that is God, beauty is God, then you must also look at this world and say, well, there's lots of other things that are not so beautiful. Who is that? Where did that come from? And you may question whether there's even a God if you have this kind of thinking. To know God, there's really only one thing you can do. Gaze at the word made flesh. God has made himself known to us in his son, scripture says. It's through his son that God now shows himself to us. If this man, Jesus, is the God of the universe, then how can science find him? Not through any of their techniques. As good as they are for understanding our, the nature around us, the nature of things, it doesn't do anything to find and talk about our great God. And maybe that's a good thing that they don't go looking for him that way. It is this, through the son, God's Son that we see his character. We see the heart of God, his love, his compassion, his grace and forgiveness. We hear the voice of God. Tongues in our ears. And the voice is the Father. And the voice says, this is my beloved son, now you listen to him. It's always the same. The message is sent the same way. Someone speaks it, and someone hears it. Jesus is God's own son. He is more than a man, he is literally God himself. And he is called here the beloved. Very specific messianic term messianic title. He's the one who has been longed for for centuries. And he is the one who is speaking with Moses and Elijah, the one who were predicting him and living with him and following him even back in the Old Testament as he led them without a body before he was incarnate. And now he's meeting with them and honoring them in this cloud up on a mountain, just like he, they used to go to the mountain in Moses' day, as we read in the Old Testament. Things all come together, you see. Old Testament, New Testament, it all fits. You meet Jesus on the mountain, that's where they met him there. That's how they recognized him here. This is as close as anyone can get to the physical God in a physical sense, you see. This is the divine standing right in front of the disciples, blazing with the glory of God. And the voice from heaven commanding, you listen to him. It's no wonder the disciples were so frightened and threw themselves face down on the ground. They were so unholy and he is so holy. We are not in the fortunate position as were those early disciples standing there on the Mount of Transfiguration where we can see the holiness of Jesus, the face of Jesus right in front of us literally, face to face, in real life. 
No, we can't do that. But we can do what God the Father said. We can listen to him. During these past weeks, we have heard his divine voice as we listened to Jesus speak to us through the words of the Sermon on the Mount. Right near the beginning of that sermon, he says, you are the light of the world. Oh, that's good, Lord. I like to hear that. And then he proceeds to crush any hope of salvation through any of the good works of being the light. Right? He says, you hide your light under a bushel basket. You murder with your words and commit adultery with your eyes. You don't tell the truth. Your sinful nature is morally corrupt and it's destined for hellfire. And if that's not commanding enough, if that's not condemning enough, you are morally imperfect. The point, of course, is that Christ must fulfill all of these commands perfectly in our place because our good is never good enough and it can, never can be. He alone is the beloved son of God. That's what God the Father called him. My one and only son, the only begotten son, we say in the creed. And God is well pleased with his good works because he is doing them for us. And with his life and with his death and with his resurrection and even with his ascension, he is gathering us into himself so that that reality becomes your reality and that resurrection becomes your resurrection of the body to the heavenly place. Now we begin to get the idea, don't we? As we're coming out of, the trans, out of the Sermon on the Mount, we're coming into the gospel. We get the idea that no one can know God without Jesus. No one can please God without Jesus. No prayers are acknowledged in God's uh, hearing and, and he will respond to it without Jesus. Unless you pray in my name, I will not answer your prayer, Jesus said. No one has perfection without Jesus. No one goes to the place that he has prepared for us without Jesus. But in Christ, connected to him, we know God. We please God. We, he, we are, have our prayers answered in his name. We carry his perfection in us. It's laid upon our sins and our sins are washed away and we have the assurance that even at this very moment we have eternal life in Jesus. Listen to him. Understand how this works in everyday life as a follower of Christ. Whether it's seeking reconciliation instead of revenge, loving your enemies, praying for those who hate you, giving to the needy, without expecting a reward, avoiding judging others, making friends with those you don't like. He makes it quite plain that the principles of living with the power of the Holy Spirit are very different from those of the rest of the world. In Christ, we are moved by the Holy Spirit to do these good works. As followers of Christ, we stand out and make a difference in our families and in our communities in the, here and around the world. Being in Christ is more than simply just getting along with the flow, just doing what everybody around us is doing. But it means letting the light of Christ shine through us and letting his love take root in us to the point that it rules us because he is our master. In Christ, it means holding back on the harsh words and letting love flow. It means not getting back, but seeking reconciliation. It means praying for those who are giving you a hard time and avoiding melting off to the people that you don't like and don't agree with you. It means forgiving those who hurt you and loving those who hate you. <coughs> Listen to him, said the Father from heaven, from the cloud. This is God revealing his will for us. This is God speaking to us and showing us 
how to live the way he created us to be before sin came in and messed it all up. This is the way he created us to be when he called us into his family by washing away our sins in holy baptism and continuing to feed us his holy supper. But I can't do this. The old man inside objects. I try, but I mess things up all the time. I want to love those who hate me, but it's so hard. The season of Epiphany began with wise men seeking the light from a star. And it ends today with a brilliant light radiating Jesus on the top of a mountain. This Epiphany event showing us who Jesus really is is the point. The man from Nazareth and also the God who has power over sin and death, over sin, not over his sin, over my sin, and over your sin. Listen to him when he also said, your sins are forgiven. You are my child. I will never leave you or forsake you. When you are in the deepest despair, I'm right there beside you. I'm there in the mud and the mess with you, no matter where you are. When you think no one else cares for you, you are my precious child. When you are afraid and need to walk down dark paths, I walk with you. Listen to him, the voice said. Listen to his words that he speaks to you directly and personally through the pages of Holy Scripture and through the mouths of those who are filled with him. That's true. We live in a marvelous and a wonderful world. But even greater than all the mysteries and wonders of creation is the one who made it all. God is all-powerful and far beyond anything we can imagine in our wildest dreams. And yet, he is a God who has come among us. He is a God who has spoken to us, literally. He has revealed himself to us through his beloved son and shown us how we can be his beloved children shining in this world. After the voice spoke to those disciples on that mountain, the disciples looked around and there was nobody there but Jesus. When we listen to him, we too will see no one but Jesus. We will see his hand at work in creation. We will see his hands with nail marks driven through them. We will see his hands raised in blessing over us. We will see him in the joys and the tears of life. In fact, we will see him everywhere for he fills all things. It is then, my friend, we will see him in the microscope and in the telescope, in the beauty of the flower and the blazing, amazing sunset. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.